We will pick up today's story with Smith going to prison for the murder of John McKnight, then the wounding of Tom Smith, and how Smith will implicate several people in the Judge Josiah Combs murder, including the faction leader Benjamin Fult French. Smith will claim that it was because of a previous scuffle that he was unable to participate in the assassination. Later, Smith, with the help of Christine McQuinn, would rob and kill Doc Grader. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine. Please fasten your seatbelts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notifications down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. Smith Indicted From the following two sources, even though all of the records of Smith's previous crimes had been burned in the Perry County Courthouse fire, he would not go free. He would still face charges for the murder of John McKnight and would be convicted on those charges. According to the Yapot source, quote, The governor had to send a militia to Hazard in order that court might be held. For the part that he took in this fight, Smith was indicted, and the case was removed to Pineville, where he was found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to the penitentiary for life. The courts of appeals reversed the decision, and the case was never tried again, unquote. According to the Wicketree website, Smith did face charges for the murder of John McKnight. Quote, following the Battle of Hazard, Smith found himself yet under another indictment, specifically relating to the killing of John McKnight, and after being convicted was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, after B.F. French had intervened by having his case brought before the Court of Appeals, they decided to reverse his sentence and had the indictment filed away, unquote. So once again, the scales of justice had tilted, and Tom Smith was once again free to roam the mountains of eastern Kentucky. For a short time, about four years, he would work and live life quietly until one day he decided to get drunk on moonshine. Smith Wounded According to the Paul Tuckett Tribune and the Birmingham Age Herald, after Smith got out of jail for the goings-on in Hazard, Kentucky, he went on to Bertha County for a little while. While he was there, he laid low enough to live a life of a libertine and worked in one of the largest department stores in eastern Kentucky named the Mammoth Department Store. There, he worked without much disturbance with the law. This was mainly due to the fact that Judge James Harless, leader of the Harless faction of the Harless Cogrill feud, owned the store. This would all change one night. He would get drunk and try to take over the town of Jackson, Kentucky and paint it red. Quote, Last September he went to Jackson one afternoon and was soon under the influence of white whiskey and began to try to run the town. When Marshal H.C. Hurst Jr. and his deputies attempted to arrest him, he and several of his chums opened fire on the officers. They returned the fire promptly. A bullet from Marshal Hurst's pistol struck Smith's left arm and shattered the bone into splinters. It also severed an artery and Smith came very near to bleeding to death. This was the first and only time he was ever wounded, unquote. It was during this time that he was healing from his gunshot wounds that he would be privy to the assassination plot of Judge Josiah Combs. Plot to Kill Judge Josiah Combs According to the Daily Ledger, Maysville, Kentucky, June 29, 1895, in Tom Smith's confession, he stated the following, quote, I was at Jess Fields and heard Fult Finch, Joe Atkins, Boone Frazier, Mrs. Fields, and Jesse Thorpe make the plot to kill Judge Josiah Combs, and afterward heard Atkins say that he fired the shot that killed him. French offered me money, but I never hired to him. Yes, he gave me clothes, unquote. It seems that even though Tom Smith was involved in the plot to kill Judge Josiah Combs, he could not participate because he was wounded. He told his sister in the newspaper reports that the reason he was wounded came from an attempt to escape from arrest in which he was shot in the arm. He also told her while he was never hired by French, 
He did give him clothes, money, and other things, and all he had to do was ask for them. While this confession was not considered to be legal testimony against Benjamin French, it did cause him to be arrested for the murder of Judge Josiah Combs and to be sued by his widow for causing the unlawful death of her husband. While French was able to free himself of these legal woes, it must have been a shock to him to hear the confession of Smith and laying the blame upon him. Catherine McQuinn During his stay in Breathitt County, Smith became intimately acquainted with Catherine McQuinn. They seemed to be of kindred spirits, as she was now considered to be a scandalous woman. Here is how their love began. Catherine was born on May 15, 1847, and was married to Jeremiah McQuinn in 1869. Their marriage seemed to be a very rocky one. As the story goes, according to the Yapot source, Mrs. McQuinn caught the attention of a store clerk of Day's Brothers Mercantile. They both had their mutual attraction and began an affair. When their love affair was discovered by Mr. McQuinn, he went stark raving mad. Because of this, Jeremiah McQuinn was sent to the asylum for treatment. This did not set well with the young man who later ended his life over the affair. Shortly after the death of the young man, Smith and McQuinn began living together as man and wife. This was even though Smith already had a wife and two children. According to the Yay Pot source, Smith gave the reason for leaving his family as, quote, she took up for the Eversoles, and I had to leave her, unquote. But this woman would do far more than just live with Smith. She would be the cause of Dark Raider's death in 1895, according to Smith. Death of Dark Raider It was well known that Dark Raider had not touched a drink of liquor in months, and that he was the leading doctor in Jackson, Kentucky. He was also well known to carry a large sum of cash on his person. McQuinn and Smith hatched a plan to rob Raider of his money. Sometime in the last of January of 1895, Smith would complain of having symptoms that was something close to having fits. Having fits in Appalachian is something like having epilepsy or some type of seizure disorder. Smith convinced Doc Raider that he needed to come to his home and watch his symptoms all night long so that he could be cured of the ailment. Raider agreed to come and brought along with him a jug of moonshine whiskey on February 4, 1895. Smith had already started drinking and Raider found that he was unable to treat Smith for his ailment. So, he began to join him in drinking. Because it had been a few months since the last time Raider drank, it did not take long for him to become very drunk. McQuinn and Smith were also very drunk. Raider stayed the night as planned and was going to leave the next morning. Sometime early on February 5th, Raider was found with a bullet hole in his heart. According to the Wicketree source, quote, In the morning after the slaying, Sheriff Brett Combs arrived at the home and was greeted by Smith, who, when questioned about what happened the night before, denied remembering anything, saying that he was too drunk to remember. Sheriff Breck and Smith had been friends since childhood, when Smith and his brother Bill had spent time living with them after the death of their parents. However, upon discovering the body of Dr. Rader, Sheriff Breck arrested his childhood friend as well as Mrs. McQuinn as suspects in the murder, unquote. According to the Daily Public Ledger, Maysfields, Kentucky, June 29, 1895, quote, Yes, I killed Doc Rader. We had been drunk together several days, and that night he tried to get Mrs. McQuinn to go after Louise Southers, a girl that he had been coming to see. She failed to find the girl, and Raider got mad at her, and she told me to kill him or he would kill me. I was too drunk to know any better, and I shot him twice. Nobody asked me to do it, unquote. It was found at trial that Mrs. McQuinn had ordered Smith to do the killing, which he did. She would later take the blame for the shooting at her trial. The Trial The trial of Thomas Smith for the death of Dr. Rader did not last long. At first, Smith thought that he would be able to wiggle out of trouble, as he always did in Perry County. However, there had been enough trouble in eastern Kentucky, and the people of Breathitt County was now determined to make an example of Smith. 
the people of the county hoped that by the conviction and execution and the sentence that the name of the county would improve as well as justice would finally come back to the area. According to the Paul Tuckett Tribune and the Birmingham Age Herald, with the belief that one party could blame the other might get them out of trouble. Quote, Both Smith and Mrs. McQuinn were arrested and tried for the crime. Mrs. McQuinn testified that Smith assassinated Raider while he slept, and Smith testified that Mrs. McQuinn shot him. It seems that each jury believed the testimony they heard, for the 12 men who tried Smith were only there three minutes in deciding that he was guilty and that his punishment should be death, while the jury that tried Mrs. McQuinn had been out for only a few minutes when they returned a verdict of guilty and fixed her punishment for imprisonment for life, the New York Sun, unquote. The trial only lasted a few days with Judge D.B. Redwine presiding. The jury came back with the guilty verdict and the gallows date was set for June 28, 1895. Catherine McQuinn was convicted as an accomplice to the murder of Dr. Rader and was sentenced to life imprisonment. She was later pardoned by Governor William Bradley in 1897. Smith no longer belonged to any of the feuding factions of eastern Kentucky, and his powerful friends would not come to his rescue. However, Smith had not lost all hope yet, and in our next video, we will cover Smith's attempt at escape, his letters to the governor, and his farewell to his sister. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Outlaws. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notifications. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.